Good morning. We'll start in our keynote presentation in just a moment. And just a reminder that the forum presentations will be recorded. And we will have time for questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Our keynote presentation today will be on building cooperative library technology for better sharing. And it will be presented by Jenny Rose Halperin. Jenny is a digital strategist, community builder, and librarian who serves as director of Library Futures at NYU Ingle Book Center on Innovation, Law, and Policy. She is focused on growing the organization and fostering a culture of open, inclusive leadership to support equitable library policy, technology, and advocacy. Jenny has held positions in community communications, product, and growth at Harvard Law School Library, Creative Commons, Mozilla, and O'Reilly Media, and she has freelanced extensively in facilitation, community, and product growth. A civic enthusiast and perennial volunteer, she has been deeply involved with various initiatives in her home city of Boston and as part of her online work in global information policy. Jenny received her MLS from UNC Chapel Hill as a Carolina Academic Library Associate and her BA from Barnard College of Columbia University. Let's give Jenny a warm welcome. Hi everyone, can everyone hear me? Great, uh, thank you so much. I'm so sorry I can't join you all in Charlottesville. It's one of my favorite places uh, to visit. I was just there uh, in March, which is um, which was a really a really great trip. It was my first time um, and I had uh, such a lovely time. So again, I'm sorry I can't join you. Um, I'm here in Glasgow uh, where I, I was at the Ice Pops conference, which is a conference about uh, copyright and games and play and teaching copyright. And it was just really interesting. Um, so I'm feeling very inspired by that community as well. Um, so thank you so much for uh, for tuning in uh, and for being in person. Uh, today's talk is called Building Cooperative Library Technology for Better Sharing. I'm going to start by going a bit into the history of OCLC, some of which you may know, some of which you may not know. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about member cooperatives, um, OCLC and other, um, other uh, community work that's been being done on controlled digital lending um, and end with a bit of a provocation to think about, you know, what member cooperatives uh, could possibly look like in the technology realm. All right, so we can start with something maybe kind of fun. Uh, does anyone remember these terminals? So I'm, um, you can put in the chat or, you know, I, I can't see anybody, but you maybe raise your hand if you remember them. Um, I'm uh, 35, but I definitely remember these. Uh, so OCLC, these OCLC terminals were how we used to access OCLC. Uh, OCLC was in many ways, one of the most pioneering projects to come out of libraries. And if you think about it, just in terms of the history of the internet and network computing, it was truly revolutionary. So started in 1967 by Fred Kilger, a pioneering Ohio librarian. It predates ARPANET, which was the first internet by two years. So ARPANET was uh, available in 1969 uh, and uh, OCLC was conceived of in 1967. The idea is simple. So instead of all libraries maintaining a card catalog, why not share a card catalog among all libraries? And so in August of 1971, the cooperative helped the Alden Library at Ohio University launch the first online catalog of any library in the world. OCLC continued to be a pioneer in many of the moves to digitize and interconnect library catalog data, and they also made libraries more efficient. So even from the beginning, it was clear to OCLC that there was money to be made in library cataloging that the cost of sourcing these records was cheap for them, even though it did cost institutions in terms of uh, employment and uh, keeping people employed, um, but the selling of them was very profitable. So through these sur surpluses, they began to expand their services and serve a worldwide network, all while getting more expensive. So one of the other things that I didn't know until I started uh, working on this presentation is that OCLC, among other things, owns the copyright to the Dewey Decimal System. So what was once a regional network of libraries in Ohio has today become a very massive institution. It serves a global community of more than 30,000 libraries, and it's one of the leading employers in the state of Ohio. 
So it's 5 million holdings and 30,000 libraries plus. And Karen Coyle writes in her blog that this kind of centralized database is, quote, yesterday's technology. So the extensive, expensive metadata information about materials has also become unaffordable and largely not needed by many public libraries that are utilizing um, other forms of cataloging. So national libraries around the world have also begun to release their bibliographic data en masse, and many larger libraries and institutions and sort of frankly wealthier libraries and institutions utilize linked open data or CC0 catalog records. So linked and particularly open data has begun to replace these centralized catalog holdings and machine processing has replaced many of the tasks that were related to that are related to cataloging that were very much once part of uh, traditional library functioning. Uh, also, as many of you know, cataloging data is often sold to libraries in large swaths, and uh, many of the pu uh, most public libraries don't really have have a need for the kind of um, catalog information that OCLC provides. Uh, however, OCLC does provide an enormous amount of information related to interlibrary loan, uh, but it could do more, which I'll get into later. And so going back for a minute to the history of OCLC, one of the biggest issues is that, like many other technology products and firms, uh, OCLC has gobbled up most of their competitors in a what could probably be called like a capitalistic blitz. Uh, and it caused the Ohio State courts to strip OCLC of its charitable status as early as 1984. However, in 1985, the Ohio State Legislature passed a law that exempted, quote, library technology development uh, from this uh, statute. So this is kind of bonkers, but I think it can help us begin as, as we begin to think about what might be next for library technology and interlibrary loan in particular. So one of the things that uh, you hear when you kind of listen to people talk about OCLC is that it is, quote, not a real member cooperative or it's not a real nonprofit. And I don't, I don't necessarily, I, I don't think that's true. Like it is a real member cooperative and it is a real nonprofit, but I think there's almost a knee jerk reaction or a, or a frustration with the way that it operates um, in particular due to some of the court cases that it's been involved in that I'll talk about in the next few minutes. Um, and also the sort of like a litigious, a generally litigious nature. Um, and also the sort of the, if you look at their 990, you'll see that their CEO is paid upward of $2 million a year. And to be fair, um, their grants to income expenses is actually pretty reasonable, a little bit over $2 million in grants to $22 million in program expenses. And so I'm definitely not a person who believes that nonprofit workers shouldn't make reasonable salaries, uh, but the differential is, is quite high. Um, and somebody uh, on a list of many, many years ago, it's something that I, I never stop thinking about uh, when, I, when I think about this kind of stuff, is that uh, OCLC's uh, acronym could possibly stand for Our Company Loves Cash. <laughs> but OCLC is what we have. And there's a reason uh, to believe that they're going to try to continue this work uh, on the extensive metadata interlo interlibrary loan market as particularly as evidenced by the recent OCLC versus Clarivate case, even as various services pop up around them. And metadata, which should be free, um, is continued to be released. So this lawsuit was settled last year. It's not the first time that OCLC was involved in antitrust litigation, uh, but it was the first time in this particular kind of a case that they were the litigant. To contrast, in 2010, Sky River, which is now owned by Ex Libris and by extension by Clarivate, sued OCLC for monopolizing the market on cataloging services, interlibrary lending, and bibliographic data, and were not successful. And so in another silly case, OCLC sued a library-themed hotel in New York in 2003 for using the Dewey Decimal System without paying them. So I looked it up, and the hotel has on their website now that their website is that the Dewey Decimal, their, their use of the Dewey Decimal System is copyrighted and, quote, used with permission. I don't, I don't know how that lawsuit settled. But in the words of Karen Coyle in 2003, as quoted by Marshall Breeding, the library market is a zero sum game. Every time one vendor wins, the other must lose because of the number of customers is not growing. The library market is a pie that can be divided into any number of slices, but the pie remains the same. This makes the rise of any one company a threat to all. With its nonprofit status, OCLC has a distinct advantage. It doesn't pay federal income tax on the revenues it brings in. 
That said, given the size and its size and the depth of its involvement in the day-to-day -day library operations, it is plausible that even without its nonprofit status, OCLC would be a formidable competitor for ILS vendors. And so what happened uh, in the Clarivate case, as per Peter Murray, is that Clarivate, Ex Libris, and ProQuest have ceased the development and marketing of their Metador Mark Record Exchange system. The entire case hinged on whether or not Clarivate could harvest uh, OCLC records and use it for another product. Uh, Clarivate, Ex Libris, and ProQuest will promptly end and permanently delete all of uh, all Metador work product that incorporated or was based on records subject to the policy. So basically, um, it settled the question of whether or not one can harvest um, OCLC records and metadata as created by this member cooperative of libraries. Still kind of questionable, um, but due to the expense or due to you know the length of the court case, it was settled and um, there will not be uh, any, any work done by Clarivate anymore on um, this other product that was supposed to spring up to create a different kind of linked open data with OCLC with OCLC's uh, holdings. And so what we could be left with and what we are left with, even though these are you know two large, uh, one large, very large nonprofit and one huge data analytics company fighting with each other over ownership of metadata records, which feels kind of bonkers also. Uh, but we're left with in many ways still a poor research resource sharing environment and one that doesn't allow for the full expression of bibliographic holdings due to what some people call a permitted monopoly. And so the question is like, does OCLC really have a monopoly? I'm not, I'm, I'm not, despite kind of going through all this stuff, I'm actually not, um, I, I don't hate OCLC. I think that they provide an incredibly useful and incredibly rich uh, product for, li for libraries. Um, but I think it's important to recognize and understand this history and understand these things and understand the Clarivate versus OCLC lawsuit that just came up as well. Um, but I do think that their work is innovative and interesting. And I do think that what they provide is, um, uh, is, is, is innovative and it's interesting. And that in many ways, what we can do is work with them and work with bibliographic holdings in order to encourage uptake of things like controlled digital lending, which I will talk about um, in a moment. And also there are some advantages to monopolies. Uh, so there is consistent predictable pricing, uh, one core source of metadata information, greater efficiency, supposedly lower costs, although who knows, um, wider reach, uh, investment in infrastructure. Uh, if you know there's no com competition, supposedly firms can invest in infrastructure, uh, and there's maximal profit for the monopoly, of course. And of course, there are cons: uh, less competition, price fixing, high prices, less innovation, restriction of outputs, and an inferior product. And I think we're seeing uh, both of these sides of pros and cons of monopolies play out uh, through this particular uh, nonprofit. Uh, and so, as many of you know, uh, Marshall Breeding really does the Lord's work every year and traces all the mergers and acquisitions within the library field. And so here's a quick uh, visualization of just how consolidated this market has become. So you can see how everything kind of reduces up into one or two very large firms. Um, but CDL for interlibrary loan is I think one of the most interesting use cases for controlled digital lending and OCLC has been at, has really been a leader on this and they work with us on the National Information Standards Organization's uh, uh, standards for controlled digital lending. Library Futures has been really involved with the library movement for controlled digital lending since our founding in January, 2021. We share the NICE, we chair the NISO standards group and participate in communication about controlled digital lending, hold webinars and educational classes about its uptake. So however you feel about what Kyle Courtney calls each flavor of CDL, uh, controlled digital lending for interlibrary loan is one of uh, the, the more important use cases that CDL can be used for. So just a quick, live, a, a quick rundown on what CDL is. Controlled digital lending is a library lending scheme that is based on fair use or fair dealing uh, in other countries. CDL requires libraries to maintain an own to loan um, ratio. Sorry, I was clicking to the chat to make sure that everything was good. Uh, so um, 
the CDL requires libraries to maintain an own to loan ratio. So basically, if you have one physical copy, you can lend one digital copy, but you must sequester the physical copy. And that's very important is the physical copy cannot be lent while the digital copy is being lent. Hundreds of libraries are doing this, including Fordham, Caltech, and Princeton. Uh, the use of CDL is probably most salient with reserves, out of print, or orphaned works. And so I'm not going to get into the details of is this legal. We can have a robust discussion, I'm sure, at the end of the talk about that um, if we want to, um, because obviously we believe it is a fair use. Um, but I am going to talk about why CDL can be transformative for libraries participating in interlibrary loan and um, a little bit about um, a little bit about OCLC's role in it. So uh, last year, a cooperative of librarians released 10 statements on using CDL for ILL. It's also kind of a catchy uh, name. Library Features hosts this statement on controldigitallending.org, which we maintain, uh, but the statement very much was written by this cooperative. And I'm going to just summarize these 10 statements, which is that interlibrary loan is understood, it's foundational, and it's protected, and that um, libraries support the rights of copyright holders by acquiring copyrighted works and interlibrary loan is one way that libraries provide materials for their patrons. Interlibrary loan of, of library materials, both digitized and born digitals, keeps in keeps with the core purposes of libraries. It builds upon the existing infrastructure, some of which is provided again by OCLC, some of which is provided by other kinds of um, library technology like Alma. Uh, and some is provided by a bunch of homegrown systems, which I'll also talk about in a moment, uh, and also best practices for temporarily lending materials. Controlled digital lending is a modern method of lending, and it replicates a library's right to loan legally acquired fiscal materials in a digital format, and the control is really what's key to this. And it directly supports ALA's core values of librarianship. Um, because it, it provides such a high level of service and uh, regardless of technology format or methods of delivery. It also, directs, uh, also directly supports the ALA Interlibrary Loan Code. Interlibrary loan is lending among libraries. Uh, interlibrary lending is legally protected within the marketplace and using CDL as a mechanism for ILL has the same effect because these, these materials are controlled and sequestered. So libraries, librarians and library staff are experts and they uh, are well versed and understand uh, the effects of this and determining parameters for, inter for controlled digital lending for interlibrary loan is within the rights, powers, obligations and judgments uh, which librarians make every day. So those are the 10 statements and there are, um, you know, this is obviously independent, was obviously written independently of platform, um, but I think what uh, I would like everyone to try to start to imagine is what an ILS would look like when digitization workflows didn't have to be replicated um, due to linked open data, any kind of, of linked data that would make it possible for libraries to share digitized copies between, themse between themselves uh, and within the confines and constraints of controlled digital lending. One of the primary things that we hear is that CDL is hard and it's clunky and it takes a lot of staff time and it takes a lot of staff work and that is completely understandable and completely true. But, you know, if digitization workflows, if the same library doesn't have to digitize the same materials over and over and over again and could employ a digital interlibrary loan system for controlled digital lending, I do think that there is a revolutionary way in which libraries can really share resources, um, maybe even in the way that was conceived of in the late 1960s and beyond. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well in a moment. So in a blog post uh, by Peter Collins of OCLC, um, he says uh, that, the, that when building digital collections, two symbiotic paths have emerged, which is librarian-oriented selection, which provides for digitization that focuses on unique holdings, fragile, uh, fragile items, and other local criteria, and patron-driven selection, which is just-in-time digitization uh, to meet the needs of individual users. So this is um, 
about when li how when libraries work on local priorities, they need document delivery workflows that allow library users to request digital fulfillment of a print item and staff workflows for digitizing, sequestering the print and supporting the loan cycle. So these two kinds of digitization, which could be utilized through CDL for ILL system, um, it meets user needs and also supports strategic priorities for libraries. And so um, I'm going to say that the that the key that the core to this is that um, what we hope to build, and I think what many of us who work in technology and have worked in technology for a long time should be thinking about building is protocols, not platforms, and not products. So rather than um, you know rather than building a platform or a product or thinking about everything in terms of productization or platformization, you know protocols like linked open data. Um, like a wiki protocol, um, even like a mark record, uh, when not owned, I, we can, um, you know, building these protocols that are pro that are platform or product agnostic should be really at the forefront of the way that we're building cooperative technology and the way that we're thinking about cooperative technology for larger communities. And so, you know, for OCLC, for example, they do provide a product but it also relies on what is now an outdated Z3950 protocol. And so the hope is that we can move on from that particular protocol and build something maybe more robust. Um, and it, But I do think that we're seeing protocols from libraries stick around for much longer than we think they should and possibly longer than we intend. And so for example, with the NISO standards, um, we're trying to build something that works for all libraries and also understands and accepts and um, is relational to the workflows that it would take to build CDL systems in general. So what would it mean to build protocols and communities together rather than investing in platforms or products? So what is a real member cooperative? What is a member cooperative? So what would it look like understanding that what we have now is flawed, but might be tractable? So not trying to necessarily prohibit like what is a monopoly, but rather think through what a group of people working together can really make. And building power for the future of libraries means drawing on and rethinking existing models through cooperative organization. As we continue to grapple with hegemonic power of corporate owned systems that includes uh, Amazon Web Services, which most of us rely on every day, big publishing, OCLC, social media platforms, knowledge institutions and organizations have to chart a cooperative, future, a cooperative path into a new digital future. So these kinds of centralized systems, companies and organizations are weaker, they can be less effective, and they're, they're more brittle. The centralization of infrastructure with corporate business platforms and big publishing dictating the future of libraries and their collections in certain ways really is a disservice to everyone. So we've built the robust digital collections, we've created communities of practice, and we've built technical infrastructure to take care of these, these resources. So it's time to put some of these to put these these resources to good use through a more cooperative and more sharing approach. In a member cooperative, each individual institution is ultimately responsible for their own collections and infrastructure, but power is built in shared responsibility, problem solving, accountability, and also funding. The big F word, right? These cooperatives can negotiate with publishers and vendors, create shared technology that benefits everyone. Uh, author professional development standards and ensure the copies of digital infrastructure aren't lost. And so the, the four spaces that member cooperatives could work in is technology, content, shared resources, and professional development. And so I, I didn't even make these up. This is the original definition of what consortia should do, and it is what many of our consortia should do now. But organizations of all types and sizes are building open infrastructure and breaking down enclosures to knowledge. And as a movement and a profession, we still recognize the primacy of digital goods, but exist largely or often in a bunch of siloed projects and communities. And an overarching principle and an overarching organizing principle that actually puts these collections in the hands of users at a large and broad scale uh, by us utilizing services that we already rely on and reducing friction uh, could also help us build something totally different. So as, as we've seen through the last you know, 30 minutes and through our entire careers, right, that library technology infrastructure and distribution channels from ProQuest 
to Ex Libris, to Elsevier, to Overdrive. Uh, they're controlled by a few corporations, and those corporations are driven by data analytics and often leveraged by investment and capital. So libraries are a service, and these are companies. Fundamentally different, um, but also have to work together in a digital space. But solving the problems of digital infrastructure is going to take a cooperative effort. In the open knowledge space, for example, hundreds of institutions have released their materials through open licenses, but cooperation, coordination, and broad scale service based solutions to technical and community problems uh, can often remain vexing and out of reach. So, why is this, and how could a cooperative approach get resources into the hands of more users? So, part of this is building real solutions for our users and addressing the age of mass digitization, corporatization, and platformization head on. I don't know if platformization is a real word or a word I just made up, but we'll go for it. So this means utilizing best practices, some of which we've already written, many of which we've already written, and we've already worked on, and leveraging community power in order to better leverage digital collections so they don't languish on siloed websites, uh, or on platforms or become increasingly unfindable or unaffordable due to the ephemerality of the web and the short life cycle of many companies. So um, I think probably many of us can point to at least one internet company that held a, a, a large amount of content and sometimes even library content um, that is gone, right? That's not, that's not there anymore. And so, for example, um, one of the organizations that I get to work with is the Flickr Foundation, and the Flickr Foundation is building a 100-year plan. The Flickr Foundation currently holds, uh, Flickr.com actually holds one of the largest collections of public domain images on the internet. And this is, is you know, this is not a library. But many libraries have contributed to this, and, the, and the, the brittleness of the company has been shown by the number of times it's been sold. So, you know, this is a sort of creating a, a digital, um, creating digital resources and having a, a number of copies in different places um, in a cooperative manner um, is really crucial to ensuring that this digital heritage is not lost. Um, and so I actually obviously do not think that the solution is to is to burn down OCLC, <laughs> to burn down these companies, right? We need reform, we need change, and um, in many ways, uh, we're already getting there. I think it's important to recognize uh, contributions of um, the work in, that uh, in particularly uh, OCLC has made, uh, and also to encourage the systems and platforms and companies and products that we all rely on, pay money to, and uh, are involved with ever, mostly on a day-to-day -day basis to encourage them to be more open in order to encourage innovation and technology and creativity within the field and within their products. Once again, it's protocols, not platforms and not products. And so the more players we have, the more innovative, open and interesting metadata and ILS services will be. But the inter-exchange between the need for a centralized source of metadata and information is clear. What, what, what we could get is a real member cooperative and nonprofit. What we could build is a real member cooperative and nonprofit, uh, one that is more invested in the work of its members. And rather than monetizing and selling back information, is committed to each individual member or institution thriving. And that could be built on the structures that we have, or we could build something entirely new. So as a whole, I believe in pressuring the systems that we have in order to make the entire system better. So OCLC does provide a crucial service as do many of the vendors and technology products that we rely on and publishers, of course. Um, and I do think that, that rather than creating something totally new, we really can pressure, um, pressure our community and pressure folks to act in the interest of the many rather than the few. Um, and the structure, again, that I laid out, it's not new. This is the kind of work that we already do through our communities and consortia. And there's so much fantastic work being done by libraries and communities around the country, around Virginia, and around the world. We can also rely on protocols like leaked open data, Creative Commons Zero, CC Zero, or other means of sharing to build upon the shared work we've already created and the shared work to come to make something better. And even though I'm well aware that cataloging is, is an art, not a science, 
uh, which I was told repeatedly during my cataloging days uh, by my wonderful boss and mentor, Lee Richardson of University of North Carolina. Um, I decided, you know, this, I, this is going to be entertaining for maybe five minutes longer. So let's let's all go there. And so I asked uh, ChatGPT to write uh, a catalog record of one of my favorite novels in Mark. That that novel is called The Green Gage Summer. It's by Rumor Godden. It's a really beautiful coming of age novel. Uh, it was out of print for many years, which is one of the reasons why I chose it. Um, so should we be terrified of stuff like this? I'm not sure. I mean, we're already getting a lot of catalog records in bulk and mass. Um, that are written by machine learning or computers. Um, but I'm not sure if we should be terrified of this. I don't think it did a very good job, frankly. And I, and I don't know if it'll ever do any better as a human hand is important and crucial to the kind of work that we do. Um, but I do think that it will take a group and a cooperative effort and approach to ensure that we are able to automate some of this, the simple stuff and the stuff we don't like doing and work together toward a better more complex, more equitable, richer, and community-centered future together. Uh, so I can also say that that ending slide is a shameless plug for our new program. So in the fall, we're gonna be working on a new series on AI uh, with a Metro Library Network and a P2PU. And so we're gonna be covering all these kinds of pieces uh, in the program. Uh, the uh, Metro Library Network is based in New York, and so are we. Um, but I, I'm hoping that we can do a little bit of in-person learning and a lot of online learning to really uh, work on answering the really sticky and tricky questions that our community might have about the future of machine learning within, um, uh, within librarianship. So thank you so much for tuning in. I think we have about 15 minutes left for questions. Um, and these are my works consulted. I'm not sure if my slides are gonna be shared, um, but if you're interested in knowing uh, the works that I used, uh, they are all here. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can look at the chat. Thank you all very right. much. Well, thank you. Let's open the floor to questions. If you could step forward and use one of the microphones in the center of the room, that would be very helpful. That will ensure that all of our attendees can hear, um, especially those that are online. If we run out of time on questions, please email your questions to viva at gmu.edu and we will share them with Jenny and then we will post the answers to the questions for you. Any questions, comments? Jenny, I have a quick question. Can you tell us how we can support library futures in the fight for balanced digital rights? Great, thank you so much for the question. Um, well, I can now see, I can see myself. Um, yeah, so we do a lot of webinars. We do a lot of, um, uh, we do a lot of uh, community educational events. We do um, a lot of papers. We're working on two large research projects um, this year. And we also support the, uh, uh, e it's called the ebook study group, which is working on legislation on uh, contract preemption in ebooks uh, around the country. There are currently uh, bills in four states. Um, I didn't talk at all about the ebooks advocacy work, but I'll take a couple of minutes to talk about it now. So um, as some of you might remember, there was a bill back in 2021 in Maryland that passed unanimously about regulating the market for eBooks. That bill was uh, challenged by and then defeated by the Association of American Publishers. The reason being that they claimed that it was preempted, that it preempted federal copyright law um, by touching on copyright. Um, and so the, the Folks who worked on that bill in Maryland, primarily Readers First, who are a very close ally of Library Futures, were pretty upset. And you know whether or not you believe that this bill was actually preempted by federal copyright, um, it was put forward by the ALA. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I don't particularly think it, it did. I mean, maybe Brandon, can, who is a lawyer, I know he's there, uh, can also talk about it. I, I think probably um, it's a, it was, it was a stretch, right? But it was threatening uh, to. Um, the uh, to the state of Maryland. And so the bill was defeated. And so we are working uh, with the ebook study group, uh, which is attached to Library Futures as a close partner, um, to introduce new, new bills that are based on um, co contractual agreements between states and ebook licensors 
uh, in order to regulate the market a bit. So in the bill, um, which you can see online, we have a model legislation and paper on our website called Mitigating the Ebook Con Conundrum. Uh, you can find it there um, and read the model bill and read the justification for the bill. Um, but basically what it says is, you know, that if you contract with a state that you have to, to do certain things. Um, and so this bill has been introduced in Connecticut and Massachusetts, and there are a few other states that we've been working on to try to, to get it, um, that we've been working with to try to get it introduced. It was um, heard in Hawaii as well. Um, but if you're interested in, in working with the ebook study group um, in order to um, help this uh, legislation become more normalized, um, definitely please reach out. Um, we'll be working on and releasing in the fall a supportive advocacy website um, that sort of goes through the issues and um, uh, shows a lot of information about pricing, meant to be a crutch or a tool for uh, lawmakers to better understand what the actual issues are and why this is a really big problem for libraries. And not to say that license, you know, not to take like a wide net view of licensing is bad all the time, but instead to take a very specific view that the way that licenses are negotiated, particularly within public libraries, does not allow them to create the kinds of robust collections that, that they have historically been able to create. Or as Ellen Paul from the Connecticut Library Association says, it's like, you know, paying money to build a road. And then two years later, uh, the uh, construction company says, sorry, you have to pay again to build the road again. It's just not, you know, it's just not yours anymore. And so, um, we want to make sure that um, when libraries are purchasing digital collections, that they are um, able to utilize those those digital collections well into the future. Um, and again, the, the the legislation is is really not uh, does not go a super far. It, it says you know that publishers cannot um, stop um, libraries from purchasing um, materials that are available to the public and, and also does not touch so much the price issue, which I know is a huge issue for many public librarians. Um, another thing is that we released very recently um, an ebook pledge for publishers with our international friends at um, Knowledge Rights 21, which is a sister group in the UK and in Europe um, that is working on the European issue because so much of this is so North American centric and also Authors Alliance, another sister organization uh, who we work very, very closely with. And so we have a lot coming out all the time. The best way to keep up is to look at our blog. Uh, we also have a truly entertaining uh, newsletter that comes out infrequently. Um, our wonderful communications manager, Laura Crossett, is just so clever and so funny. Uh, and she has um, also a really robust social media presence, which you may or may not have seen. The last thing is that if you're more, if you're interested in getting involved with policy or advocacy, we do have a small group of uh, folks who meet about once a month uh, to kind of chat, and it's a very casual meetup about uh, the kinds of issues that we work on. And from that, a lot of really wonderful ideas get thrown around, and you get to sort of meet a lot of folks and hear about what's going on in policy and advocacy. So those are just some ways to get involved. Um, I know because it's sort of hybrid, um, I'm not going to drop links in the chat, but I will send links to Sophie and to Tanya after the talk, and we can, um, and hopefully uh, they can help distribute distribute those links. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Oh, okay. So what plans are you taking at the federal level in order to not duplicate your efforts in each state? Um, that's a really great question. Um, so I think uh, it would be amazing if there was a federal ebook bill, right? And so, you know, when you look at other uh, internet rights issues that have come up in the last 20 years, uh, right to repair, and net neutrality among them, what you see is that all of these states pass slightly different, um, but also still very impactful um, legislation. And eventually the federal government was moved to action. And so um, similarly, you know, the more states that can introduce and pass this bill, uh, the more likely it is for the federal government to take action. There is a model uh, controlled, uh, controlled digital lending bill, and there is a model ebooks uh, bill 
that has been floating around among tech policy people. But I, I mean, to be really frank, um, I, it is unlikely. There are so many things the federal government has to worry about right now. Um, and I, I do not think that um, ebook contracts, which are generally negotiated at a state level, um, are, is one of them, um, although it would be great. Um, you might remember, or you might not have seen, um, but that is also on our blog, that um, Senator, thanks to our advocacy and the advocacy of many other organizations, including Readers First and Public Knowledge, um, Senator Ron Wyden and Representative Eshoo issued a letter to aggregators and to publishers asking them uh, you know, how they negotiate ebook contracts and why ebooks are so expensive for the people in their states. As far as federal efforts, that's sort of the, the primary thing that has happened right now. This was over a year ago, and we have not gotten a response. They have not gotten a response. We do not know. Um, we also participate fairly frequently, and if you are interested in participating, please reach out. Um, we participate in Hill Walks for Libraries. This year we met with Senator John Ossoff. He is very tall in person, um, which was, I, I was pretty starstruck. Um, but we met, sorry, we met with our, uh, yes, so um, uh, we do do hill walks about once or twice a year uh, in DC, which I know is very, is, is could be very easy for folks from Virginia to get to. Um, and we do those usually with, with our friends at Public Knowledge. Um, the last thing that I do want to um, sort of talk about organizationally, I, I like to, I usually like to start about, um, uh, I usually like to start with just a just a talk and then maybe go into a little bit about the organization itself because, you know, um, I want to I want to keep in, in line with the theme. But um, so another thing that we have been working on are very small group um, communities called learning circles, which is uh, very much drawn from the work of P2PU. And these learning circles will include in the fall something on congressional advocacy. So we'll be doing a congressional advocacy training. Uh, with our friends at Public Knowledge, which is something that we did in the spring and was very successful. So basically how to talk to your lawmakers about uh, library advocacy. Um, it's a really uh, open and wonderful way to sort of le learn a little bit about how these things work, learn about how to introduce a state bill, learn about how to work um, in the advocacy field um, at a federal level. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question, um, but basically um, we are um, we are working very closely with the ebook studies group uh, in order to um, ensure that the that these kinds of bills are adapted also for each state's individual consumer protection law, and also that um, there is sort of a combination of general advocacy skills for li libraries and librarians who want to um, work on these issues and also. Um, at the state level that folks feel empowered to introduce uh, appropriate legislation for, for the kind of work that they do. Um, so another question is, would you talk a bit about the International Statement of Solidarity? Yeah, that was um, a project that we worked on a couple of years ago with ebook SOS, it's hashtag ebook SOS, uh, which made international news. Um, a librarian named Johanna Anderson and uh, Caroline Ball um, her colleague, um, they uh, were pretty appalled at the prices that UK libraries were facing um, in uh, around COVID. And I mean, if you look at the spreadsheet, which you can find on their website, ebook, I think it's ebooksos.org. I mean, they are appalling. Um, even just the, the level of materials that were available to them. Um, I, please do not quote me on this, um, but I do know that, for example, at one point, um, Hachette was offering five titles in total to the UK as a whole. And when you get to non-English language materials that are digital, um, it gets even worse. So it was an availability and pricing uh, advoc grassroots advocacy campaign. Um, and so we worked with them and with Knowledge Rights 21 and with IFLA, the International Federation of Library Associations, who have been wonderfully supportive over the years, um, to release an international statement of solidarity. Out of that international so statement of solidarity, we are now working on this ebook pledge, which repeats many of the same points, um, but is a little bit more extensive and definitely aimed at publishers. Um, IFLA and Knowledge Rights 21 are going to take the um, the publisher pledge to the uh, Competition and Markets Authority 
in order to talk to them about, you know, how can we get um, how can we get better and fairer book term digital book terms uh, for um, for Europe as a whole. And we're also hoping that some of that work leads into um, really alerting uh, the federal lawmakers to the to the issues at hand. Um, internet the International Statement of Solidarity um, definitely. If you are interested in signing it, definitely do. Um, we got a, a lot of people and institutions signing it very, very quickly. And it was a really exciting initiative, um, but it was, it, was, it was quite a while ago now. Um, and uh, ebook SOS, if you're also interested in sharing um, information with your patrons or your users or even your colleagues, they have a lot of really excellent videos that are, that are translatable across, um, across the ocean, I guess. And um, they're definitely worth uh, worth checking out. They're also very cute. They're like claymation. They're they're very very fun. Are there any other questions? Um, I'm here in person. Um, I was just wondered if uh, you could speak a little bit more um, to reconcile the profit motive centralized approach of these big companies like Ex Libris and you know uh, all, all the ones you mentioned, especially in light of the fight between the Internet Archive versus the publishers lawsuit, just because um, the big companies are showing that they're very litigious in, when they want to get their way. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to hearing Brandon's update uh, right after me, I think, on, um, uh, the, on the Internet Archive case as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, so obviously the first ruling in the Internet Archive case was pretty disappointing. Um, we have on our website, on the Control Digital Lending website, we did do a live blog with different experts talking about the case as it was happening. But yes, the outcome of, of the internet, or the first outcome of the Internet Archive case, so that they will be appealing, hopefully. Um, we wait every Friday to find out if this is the time when we know if they're appealing and what, what is next. Um, it's been 10 Fridays and we still don't know. Um, but um, so yes, that the outcome of that case was uh, so far has been very, very, very disappointing. And yes, um, the four publishers that, that sued have proven to be uh, litigious. And as we've seen through this presentation, OCLC can be uh, very litigious. But I also think that, um, you know, when you look at the actual consequences that we've seen for breaching, um, for breaching contracts, um, it's actually very, very rare for libraries uh, to be sued. Um, there are a few cases, but it's it's not it's not very common. And also, libraries tend to be pretty risk averse and don't tend to actively and flagrantly breach contact uh, sorry breach contracts or participate in the kind of like very public um, copyright uh, questions that say the Internet Archive um, engages with. I think much more common what we see is a shutting off of of service. To libraries and to patrons and collections, um, which is obviously um, pretty deleterious when it comes, literally deleterious, right? It pulls it out uh, for um, for libraries and for patrons and for researchers. Um, we've also seen um, papers having to be retracted if they violate uh, terms of service of various um, of, of various companies. So um, I know that's that's a, kind of a non-answer to your question. Um, and I do, I do understand um, that there that there may have been a bit of a chilling effect, particularly around uh, working with controlled digital lending, which is a pretty clear fair use um, in the kind of ways that libraries have been using uh, controlled digital lending, which frankly is like quite different from the way that the Internet Archive has been doing it, um, and also provides access uh, to their patrons, right? So. Um, on top of the non-answer, I will say that um, CDL, like participating in communities of CDL, um, checking in with the general counsel about what is permitted and what is not, and also understanding that many of the contracts and the vendors that we work with and that we sign, um, and the, the contracts that we sign, um, some of those contracts are actually indirect. Um, uh, they're not in concordance, right? It, certain things are prohibited and then allowed, there's a lot of sort of lack of clarity um, in terms of, of what we can and cannot do 
Um, and I do think that there is a, it's an opportunity to kind of take advantage of that um, and to really just, just focus on providing the best level of service to um, users and to patrons, no matter what the outcome of the Internet Archive case is, because it was also pretty idiosyncratic and very specific to the circumstances at hand. If you read the, uh, if you read the um, decision fairly carefully, you will also see that CD, he doesn't really, the judge doesn't really touch CDL. Um, he's, he very much takes um, fault with a lot of the, the facts of the case at hand. And some of them are really dangerous. Um, and some of them should really concern us as a community. One of the main things I think that is pretty concerning is that he says that because the Internet Archive has a donate button on their page, that they are suddenly a commercial entity that is, uh, you know, uh, that should be treated as such. I think, and I think many of us will see that, that, that that's a very, very, very dangerous concept. And the hope is that on appeal, that those kinds of decisions will be reversed. Um, I feel like I, I, I hope I've, I've, I've answered your question. Um, but basically, I think um, that, you know, institutionally, our mandate is in many ways, is in all ways to provide the best level of service to our users, no matter the outcome of this case and no matter the outcome of, um, you know, what a judge might might say about whether or not a, an organization is nonprofit because they have a donate button on their website. Um, but um, yeah, it's it's not great. I will, I'm not gonna lie and say that it's it's like that the outcome of this was wonderful and that the appeal might not get more, it might, it might get messier, it might get worse. Um, but at the same time, um, I do wanna, want to make it clear that the decision was very much focused on what happened in March to June of 2020, um, in which the Internet Archive released um, the, the lending periods from the, these books. It does not have to do that much with whether or not a library can do uh, controlled digital lending. It is a pretty established library practice uh, within certain kinds of systems. Um, and also, you know, Open Library um, itself works with many uh, libraries, including the Boston Public Library, um, in order to release um, very specific kinds of collections. And the case also hinged on 127 out of several million books. Um, the last thing I did want to bring up, which is something um, that uh, so I feel like I'm just, I'm just like, here's some cool things that we're doing. Uh, we're going to do a game show called What Does That License Say Anyway uh, later in the summer. Um, and one of the things that I recently learned uh, about uh, these uh, licenses and about these contracts is that, for example, um, the UC agreement with Elsevier that was sort of heralded as this big moment in open access, which it was, it had 600 amendments. All of these amendments had to be um, vetted and negotiated and understood by lawyers and it, um, and also experts in the field and librarians. It was a huge amount of work, right? And so many of us aren't signing contracts that have that many amendments that are specific and appropriate to our own institutions. And also many of us are negotiating these contracts all the time. So basically what I wanna say is like, the chilling effect is real, the chilling effect is intentional, but I don't think that it necessarily should prohibit um, the should prohibit institutions from providing and individual librarians from providing the best level of service that they possibly can um, to their users and to their patrons. And at the end of the day, I do think that CDL, controlled digital lending, um, is protected even with the outcome of the case. Still legal. <laughs> Um, how viable would it be for the Library of Congress to take a more visible and leading role in promoting your goals? That would be rad. <laughs> that would be awesome. Um, and, you know, the, the folks at the Library of Congress, um, uh, some of the folks at the Library of Congress uh, we've, we've met with, we've um, been a part of communities uh, with, as a relatively young nonprofit, I think, um, you know, the more that we can get involved with those kinds of communities, um, the better. And, you know, I think one of the things about the Library of Congress is that it's not a national library, um, but the Library of Congress has also been a leader um, in certain ways. The, uh, the copyright roundtables on AI that they just did, it's hours of really interesting listening 
because uh, they're all put online, um, I think was really was really cool and really innovative. Um, and I'm excited to dig into these um, into these issues with them. But it's a big institution, and we're five people, so I think. Um, the more uh, and also there's a sort of a level of politicization where you know if you work at the Library of Congress you can't support individual bills um, but just in terms of library advocacy and empowering libraries to um, and, and individual librarians to really advocate for the kinds of goals um, and education and learning more about technology um, I am uh, really pleased and um, proud to, to call many of the folks who work at the Library of Congress colleagues and friends and um, I'm, I hope that the sort of longer we are in a community and the more um, goodwill that we can uh, create through presentations and through, I'm sorry, so sorry I can't be in person and through working together um, that we can uh, work with the folks at the Library of Congress more extensively. Does anyone have any questions? Did we have any more in chat? No, I think we're good. Um, well, thank you all so much. I will be sharing out um, links and also we're excited. Um, I don't think my slides would make much sense on their own, um, but I can also share out my slides. Um, if any of you want a um, picture of an OCLC terminal or the uh, European I Gift It Up contest, which is the gift that keeps on giving. That's where a lot of my um, uh, that's where a lot of my slides came from. And also, you can check out the recording if you just want to see it again. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, definitely feel free to reach out to me. Um, I am going to put the Library Futures email in the chat as well as my personal email. So we're info at libraryfutures.net, and I am Jenny at libraryfutures.net. And we are on all the social medias as well. Um, but definitely feel free to reach out um, if you're interested in getting involved or learning more about the kind of work that we do, um, or even just to get added to our to our large coalition partners uh, web, uh, email list in which we announce um, things like um, our policy, our, our monthly policy calls um, and, other, and other advocacy opportunities um, that are coming up. Um, so thank you again so much. I wish I could see all of you. I wish I could be in person with all of you, um, but hopefully this won't be the last opportunity. Um, and uh, I hope to I hope to meet many of you soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>